I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Ford School, and it is really a pleasure to see so many of you here for our event this afternoon. We are particularly honored to be hosting Joshua Dubois. Joshua is President Obama's spiritual advisor, and he recently published a book of the devotionals that he's been sending the president every day for six years. <laughs> We also look forward during uh, the presentation to hearing some of the passages from the book. <coughs> Before I introduce Joshua more fully, um, I'd like to note that the Ford School Center for Public Policy and Diverse Societies is, one of the, is a co-sponsor for this event today. And I'd also like to thank one of our students, Mav Ibrahim, who helped us to arrange Joshua's visit today. Thank you very much. Today's topic, the intersection of religious tradition and politics, is a little different from many of the topics that we take on in our Policy Talks lecture series. But as a school of public policy, we really would be remiss if we overlooked the impact of religious tradition on the decisions of the world's policymakers. And that's true both here, abroad, here and abroad, as I think we all know. It is certainly of great significance to the President of the United States. And in fact, as some of you may know, our school's namesake, President Gerald R. Ford, was a deeply religious person. His son, Mike, who serves on the school's advisory committee, is an ordained minister. And the Presidential Library, Ford Library, which is just uh, around the corner here in Ann Arbor, houses President Ford's personal reflections. And one of the handwritten notes in that collection is entitled, What Religion Means to Me. In his note, President Ford writes, my religious beliefs give me guidance and strength on a day-to-day -day basis. My conviction is very personal, and I am most reluctant to speak or write about it publicly. Well, that was written in 1979. Today, knowledge of our policy leaders' spiritual and religious identities is much more in the public domain than it was at that time. And our speaker this afternoon will discuss how the current president draws inspiration from religion and how the administration navigates some of the complicated religious issues with the 21st century White House. In addition to his role as spiritual advisor to the president, Joshua Du Bois served in a official capacity at the White House as the executive director of the Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. He is a graduate of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and Boston University. And in 2008, he was the Religious Affairs Director of the Obama Presidential Campaign before transitioning to the White House. I'd like to remind our audience that if you have a question to pose to our speaker, um, please write it on one of the cards that should, was passed out as you came in the room. Uh, Ford School volunteers will begin collecting the cards at about 4.40. And then with help from Valenta Cabo, who is the Diversity Center's Program Director, and our Director of Graduate Career Services, Jennifer Niggemeyer, two of our students, Mab Ibrahim and Luke Horner, will read your questions. If you're watching online, I hope you will submit your questions using Twitter, and please use the hashtag PolicyTalks. And with that, it is my great pleasure to welcome Joshua to the podium. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dean Collins, for that wonderful introduction and for your leadership of this school and this community as well. It's such an honor to be with all of you this afternoon. Um, I, I have to say, um, with a certain amount of apprehension, I was, um, was raised in um, central Ohio by a school that you may be familiar with. And this backdrop is making me very nervous, so don't tweet this to any of my friends from high school or I will never be able to go home again, okay? I think we all know what we're talking about here. I won't go any further, but I um, also want to acknowledge um, my wonderful wife, Michelle, who's here with us today. We've been married for exactly 78 days, and so if I have this goofy grin on my face, that's why. <laughs> so, thank you. And my dear friend and former colleague and just a wonderful, wonderful person, Mab Ibrahim. Mab was our intern in the White House faith-based office and then worked for our consulting company, Values Partnership. She doesn't know it, but this is actually a bit of a recruiting trip to try to convince her to come back to D.C. here at the Ford School. And to all of you, thank you for having me. I um, hope um, that you will uh, be able to learn more about this book, The President's Devotional, and our work at the intersection of faith and politics, but hopefully that we'll be able to spend most of our time in dialogue and questions and answers with, with all of you. So, you know, when I first started working for Barack Obama, I had no idea 
I was going to become his spiritual advisor and send him a devotional every morning. I was um, a preacher's kid from Nashville, Tennessee, fresh out of a public policy degree myself, mine at the Woodrow Wilson School, and um, I started working in his Senate office in early 2005. I was a legislative correspondent, basically writing letters to constituents um, from Illinois. Um, then transitioned into the 2008 Obama campaign um, at the beginning of that campaign, doing outreach like thousands of others around the country. But, you know, my personal faith was very important to me. Separate from my professional life, my, my Christian walk and journey was probably the, 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 um, the centerpiece of my life. And in my private times, I would just spend time praying for this man, uh, this senator who would be president, that God would protect him and that he would start every day with a sense of purpose and joy and really remember why he was doing what he was doing. Um, and in the course of one of those prayers on the campaign, just kind of by myself, I just felt a strong sense that, you know, this is a guy in Barack Obama who had a lot of different um, support around him. He had policy advisors, he had political support, but I wondered who was thinking about his soul, you know, who was helping him cultivate that aspect of himself, uh, separate from his, his formal work um, running for president. Um, and I decided that I should send him an email and that um, I would get his email address from a friend of mine. It was Reggie Love, his body man at the time on the campaign. Um, and I would send him a, an inspirational note to start his day. I had no idea if you were allowed to email senators. I had never done anything like that before. Um, and so, um, you know, I wasn't sure what the response would be, but I, I drafted up a brief note. The first one was on the 23rd Psalm and a poem that I love by Wendell Berry called The Faith of Wild Things. And um, I sent it off to him. And a few minutes passed and no response, and then a few more minutes and no response, and then started thinking how I was going to explain to my mother that I got fired for emailing a senator. And um, <laughs> a few minutes later, he wrote me back and said, uh, Joshua, I don't know how you thought of this, but this is exactly what I needed this morning. Would you mind doing it every day? And six years later, I've been sending him um, these notes every single morning. Now, in addition to that sort of personal work, um, uh, separate from my job, um, I transitioned into the White House, and I led the White House faith-based office. My job was to um, help the Obama administration partner with religious groups and secular nonprofit organizations all around the country on a range of uh, public policy and social service concerns, from um, setting up job training programs at thousands of congregations to helping uh, feed the hungry through food pantries at local congregations to navigating the contours of religion and foreign affairs. And so um, I won't go into a lot of that work today, um, but I would encourage you to ask me anything about um, that, that that work leading the White House faith-based office. But separate from that, every single morning I would send him um, these devotionals, um, devotionals that sought to um, give the president a sense of purpose, a sense of joy, um, help him uh, navigate how to love his neighbors, even those who are very difficult to love, which is a constant theme in Washington. Um, and, you know, about a, a little over a year ago, I decided, and I talked to the president, decided that if these um, meditations have been helpful for to him, and he said that they meant the world to him, um, including on the cover of the book, which I'm so honored by, if, if they've been helpful to him, then maybe they'll be helpful to other people as well. So I'd love to share a few of them with you. In addition to that, um, there are 365 devotionals in the President's Devotional, but each month also begins with a story about a lesson that I've learned at the intersection of faith and politics um, in the White House. And I'll share a few of those stories as well, if that's okay. And then we'll move into a period of Q&A after that. So you mind if I do a little reading? Right. I'm going to grab a stool. Seems so far away from you guys behind this thing. <laughs> All right. um, you know, one of the constant themes that we would focus on um, is uh, of, uh, a theme of, of prayer, how the president could, in the context of a very um, difficult um, life and the, the challenges that he faces every single day, have a, have a, um, a robust prayer life, being in uh, communication with um, with, with God and, um, and having a dialogue with, uh, on, on uh, principles that are much bigger than, than politics. And so I'll read a devotional that kind of focused on that theme. And again, I should note, um, and I'd love to talk about church state issues and other things as, as well in the Q&A period. These were all done on my personal time before I got to, the, to work in the morning. And so it's kind of a, um, uh, just a personal service that I provided for the president. But this one is from November 15th. It's called Just Me and You starts off with a, um, a verse from the book of Matthew. One other uh, quick note, the president's a, a Christian, um, and so much of many of the devotionals, all of the devotionals um, are meant to help him cultivate his own personal um, religious journey. That said, I think uh, a lot of the principles here are accessible to people of all different faiths and backgrounds and beliefs. So again, this is November 15th. It's just me and you. 
First uh, Matthew 6.6. 6. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And then the reflection. When Bill Moyers served as President Lyndon Baines Johnson's press secretary, he was famous for being a calming presence in the face of larger-than-life LBJ. One day at lunch, Moyers was in the middle of saying grace before their meal, and Johnson exclaimed to him, Speak up, Bill. I can't hear a damn thing you're saying. Moyers quietly replied, That's because I wasn't addressing you, Mr. President. <laughs> Moyers knew that prayer is a conversation between us and God, nothing more and nothing less. The God of this universe wants to talk with us and hear our troubles and guide our steps. Let's take advantage of that wonderful opportunity and spend time communing today with him. They close with a prayer. Dear God, I appreciate the opportunity to be in conversation with you. I bring to you my praise and confessions and requests and thoughts. It's just me and you. Amen. So that's an example of one of the devotionals about prayer. Another um, regular theme was how to um, process all of the um, sort of antipathy and um, ill will that is a constant presence in Washington, how, how to um, navigate that, not just from a practical perspective, but from a spiritual perspective, when people don't just disagree with your policies, but sometimes really just dislike you. You know, how do you, how do you work through that? Um, and that was a, a theme that I would regularly come back to. And so here's another devotional on that point. It's from February 22nd. It's called Forgiving the Pain. It starts off with a verse from 1 John. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. Then a quote. I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hates so stubbornly is because they sense, once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. That's James Baldwin, Notes of a Native Son. It concludes with a prayer. Lord, if we have any intense feeling, even hatred for any of your creatures, we pray for its release. Search our emotions and root out any ill will. We have reasons, good reasons, for certain antipathies. But today we make an effort to forgive. And once we have forgiven, we ask you to help us deal with any underlying pain. Amen. And so that's... um. Uh, one of the, the, the devotionals on that subject of really processing um, the hatred that's sometimes sent our way. The last uh, uh, example I'll read, um, actually, no, I'm not going to do that one. Let me do another one. Um, one of the, uh, the last theme that I focused on a lot was um, really how to have joy. The president's a very serious guy, um, and he obviously deals with very serious issues, and so I'd often um, come back to how even in the context of those thorny and weighty challenges that he and we faced every day, he could still find some time to laugh and smile and even dance. And that's what this one's about. It's on January 6th. It's called He Danced. It starts off with a quote. Yes, to dance beneath the diamond sky with one hand waving free, silhouetted by the sea, circled by the circus sands, with all memory and fate driven deep beneath the waves, let me forget about today until tomorrow. That's Bob Dylan, Mr. Tambourine Man. Then it's a verse of scripture. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. Then it concludes with a reflection. David, the king, the ruler of the nation of Israel, the man on whom the mantle of God rested, and from whose lineage would emerge uh, Jesus, David, in wild abandon, danced. He danced because the Lord had been good. He danced because despite unspeakable trials, he was still alive. He danced because it gave glory and honor to the God who had formed him. He danced because the weight of sin had been lifted off of him. He danced and danced, and then he danced some more with all he had, with all his might. Let's pray for some of that joyful abandon today. Let's seek out the moments when the seriousness of life melts away in the heat of God's glory, and we are free to let loose, shout, glorify God, and dance. So I don't know if the president actually danced when he read that devotional, but hoping it helped him <laughs> brighten his day just a little bit. Um, so as I said, in addition to the devotionals, um, each 
month um, in this book begins with a lesson that I learned in the White House. Um, some are on lighter uh, subject matters, like how the president encouraged Michelle and I down the path towards marriage, or how he navigated relationship with some wonderful um, seniors that he, that he he worked with, and some other subjects as well. Um, but some are you know on some public policy issues that were somewhat difficult um, uh, to to navigate, and. Um, I'm going to read one of the ones. This is one of the essays that was um, probably uh, the most difficult, um, actually the second most difficult for me to write. I'll read another one um, at the end. Um, but this one was about a disagreement that we had in the White House on a very important policy issue, um, the navigation of uh, the intersection of religious liberty and, uh, and the right of women to have contraception um, paid for by their employer. And sort of, uh, it doesn't focus as much on the policy, but rather the moral lesson that I learned um, in the context of that debate. And so I'll, I'll read this for you. It's from July. It's called On Disagreement. It's a little bit of a longer essay. So what do you do when you disagree with your boss and your boss's boss and maybe even the president of the United States? That's where I found myself in the fall and winter of 2011 on one of the most important challenges of our day, religious liberty and a historic conflict with the Catholic Church. The issue was fairly clear. President Obama's Affordable Care Act, popularly known as Obamacare, as you all know, made preventative services, including contraception, free for millions of American women paid for by their employers, which I thought was a very good thing. But the unresolved question before President Obama in late 2011 and early 2012 was whether employers that objected to contraception on religious grounds, say for example the Catholic Church, would have to pay for it as well. Faith-based organizations like the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops were on one side of the debate, and women's rights groups like NARAL and Planned Parenthood were on the other. And in the White House, opinions fell roughly along the same fault lines. On one side, I stood with two very senior officials who were closely connected to the church and had grown up sitting in pews. In our opinion, it was blindingly obvious that government just can't force religious organizations to pay for things they don't believe in. I also believe that President Obama's decision on this issue would send a broader signal about religious liberty in our country and permanently shape his relationship with faith-based groups. In my view, there had to be another way to make sure that women had access to contraception without infringing on the rights of the church. On the other side of the issue were several White House and agency officials, also much more senior than I, most of whom had deep histories with the women's advocacy community. In their view, well, for months, I didn't understand their view at all, actually. I knew their opinions had to do with women's access to contraception, regardless of where they work, but to me, it didn't add up. Their inability to make this relatively small concession to religious organizations seemed to me to be unreasonable at best, and at worst destructive. For months, the two sides battled it out in large staff meetings and small group discussions and private emails. The Catholic bishops, women's groups, and U.S. congressmen and senators were feverishly lobbying the president as well, which didn't help a bit. On several occasions, particularly the large group meetings we would have in the Roosevelt Room, that imposing Woodline Conference Room in the White House's West Wing, I felt like I was the only voice advocating for religious liberty while other staff, years my senior and far more persuasive, were lined up on the other side. Every time I had to address the issue, I had the sensation of a very small man about to jump off a very high cliff. And then the big day came, the day President Obama would announce his decision. I was up all night the night before with a knot in my stomach in fervent prayer. The next morning, a sunny one, unseasonably warm for a January day, I walked into my office on Jackson Place, a row of townhouses directly across from the White House, and made a few calls to West Wing staff to see if there was an update on the president's decision. Strangely, I couldn't get through to anyone. I waited a few hours and then called again. No answer. I decided to go for a walk around the West Wing and the Eisenhower Building, where many of the president's staff offices are, to see if I could find someone, but no one was available to see me. I returned to my desk and I saw the voicemail indicator flashing on my phone. Finally, some news. I checked the message and it was a polite voicemail from one of our senior staff asking me to give her a call back. However, at the end of the voicemail, she thought she had hung up the phone, but the line was still active. I could hear her say to her assistant, I just called Joshua back, but I don't really want to talk with him. At this point, there's nothing left to say. If he calls back, take a message. (laughs) So as you might imagine, my heart dropped and I slumped into my chair. That was it. I had my answer. I didn't need to hear it formally. 
The president had clearly decided to not exempt religious groups from the requirement to buy contraception. This was, in my opinion, a historic breach of relationship with the church, much bigger than this particular issue. But it also meant I had failed. I felt a wave of shame and regret. Perhaps if I had fought harder or taken a different approach, the religious community would have been better protected and the president better served. But mostly, I was angry, very angry. They manipulated him, I thought, believing that staffers on the other side of the issue had unfairly used outside voices to lobby the president. How could they not understand how important this is? They never wanted the right result, I thought. They just wanted to win. I was sick to my stomach the rest of the afternoon and evening and into the next day. The public reaction was as I anticipated. The religious community was livid, and all I could do was watch. As the calls poured in from friends and allies, my anger burned hotter, and eventually I had enough. I marched into the office of one of the most senior staffers in the White House, a neutral party on this issue, and I let it rip. How could they, I said. Their arguments were so specious, dishonest, I continued. Don't they know what this will do to the president, to the country? I didn't hold anything back. And then I settled back into my chair and stared at him with daggers in my eyes. The recipient of my wrath, a Washington veteran with many more battles under his belt than I, took it in calmly, even empathetically. But his reply still rings in my ears to this day. He said, Joshua, I understand why you're upset. It's a huge issue. But I need you to know that as passionately as you feel right now, as angry as you are, as hurt as you feel on behalf of the people you serve, there are people on the other side who feel just as passionately and would have been just as angry and just as hurt. For you, he continued, faith is a big part of your context. It's the space in which you work and live. But other people have other contexts. I know some in this building, he said, people who I've known for 20 years for whom the protection of women's rights is as deep in their marrow as religious liberty is in yours. For them, it's unthinkable, I mean really unthinkable, that even one woman would have unequal access to medical care. He concluded, you can question policy decisions, Joshua. You can disagree with people, even vehemently, but you should be very, very careful before you question others' motives. Not only is it not fair, but in this case, I truly believe your attacks on them are wrong. They do care about the president, and they care about the country. They just ended up in a different place on this issue. How would you feel if someone said behind your back that you really didn't care for the president or the religious community and you just wanted to win? Would that be accurate? Would it be right? I sat there, my temperature still high and my hands still shaking, but fighting a new reality that was beginning to settle in. A reality where I felt just as passionately about religious liberty and was just as confident in my view, but where my opponents weren't evil or dishonest, just in sincere, passionate disagreement with me. And I started to realize that in this country, that's a place they're allowed to be. The issue did not go away. And in fact, the president made some significant adjustments to the contraception policy. Eventually, I believe we moved towards a place where both religious liberty and the rights of women were protected. But for me, there was an even larger point. The book of Proverbs, chapter 21, verse 2, tells us, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. The Lord weighs the heart. Not me, not anybody else but God. And until the time when I can ask him face to face about someone else's motives, I have no business questioning them myself. My job was to fight as hard as I can and as fair as I can. And in the meantime, to love every person I come into contact with and let God work out the rest. And so that was the story on religious liberty. Um, the, the last one that I will read before one concluding devotional, um, that was probably the most... Uh, one of the most challenging policy issues that we tackled, but the next one was probably the most difficult personal issue um, I addressed um, in the White House. And it was also one of those times where I really got to see who this man, President Obama, really is. Oftentimes we sort of see him as an avatar, some figure on our television screen that we don't really truly know. Um, but this was one of those moments, uh, one of the worst days I've had, but one of those times where I really got to see the president's character, and I'll conclude with this. It's from May, it's called Done in Secret. It's about the time that I traveled with President Obama to Newtown after the horrible tragedy there. The White House is not supposed to be a place for brokenness, sheer shattered brokenness. But that's what we experienced on the weekend of December 14th, 2012. I was sitting at my desk around midday on Friday the 14th when I saw the images flash on CNN. 
There was a school, a gunman, and children fleeing and crying. It's sad that we've grown so accustomed to these types of scenes that my first thought was, I hope there are no deaths, just injuries. I thought maybe it's just your run-of-the-mill scare. And then the news from Sandy Hook Elementary School, a small school in the tiny hamlet of Newtown, Connecticut, began pouring in. The public details were horrific enough. 20 children murdered and six staff, parents searching a gymnasium for signs of their kids. But the private facts that we received in the White House from the FBI were even worse. And I won't go into them now. That news began a weekend of prayer and numbness, which I awoke from on Saturday only to receive word that the president would like me to accompany him to Newtown. He wanted to meet with the families of the victims and then offer words of comfort to the country at an interfaith memorial service. I left early to help the advance team, the hardworking folks who handle logistics for every event, set things up. And I arrived at the local high school where the meetings and memorial service would take place. We prepared seven or eight classrooms for the families of the slain children and teachers, put two or three families in every classroom, and put water and tissues and snacks in each one. Honestly, we didn't know how to prepare, but that was the best we could think of. The families came in and gathered together room by room. Many struggled to offer a weak smile when we whispered, the president will be here soon. A few of them were visibly angry, so understandable that it barely needs to be said. And they were looking for someone, anyone to blame, but mostly they sat in silence. I went downstairs to greet President Obama when he arrived and I provided an overview of the situation. I would say, there, sir, there are two families per classroom, and the first in is, and I would say that family's name, and their child was, and I would say that child's name, and the second is, and their child was, and I would go on down the line. The president took a deep breath and steeled himself and went into the first classroom. And what happened next, I'll never forget. Person after person received an engulfing hug from our commander in chief. He'd say, tell me about your son. Tell me about your daughter. Then he'd hold up those school pictures of the lost beloved as their parents described their favorite food and their television shows that they watched and the sound of their laughter. For the younger siblings of those who had passed away, many of them were two or three years old. They didn't really understand what was going on. The president would grab them and toss them up into the air, try to get them to laugh, and then hand them a box of White House M&Ms, which he kept in his pocket. In each room, I saw his eyes water, but he did not break. And then, and this was the crazy thing, the entire scene would repeat itself again for what felt like hours over and over again through well over a hundred relatives of the fallen, each one equally broken and wrecked by the loss. After each classroom, we would go back into those fluorescent hallways and walk through the names of the coming families. And then the president would dive back in like a soldier returning to a tour of duty in a worthy but wearing war. We spent what felt like a lifetime in those classrooms and every single person received, received the same tender treatment the same hugs, the same looks directly in their eyes. I remember worrying about the toll it was taking on him. You know, the staff did all the preparation, but the comfort and healing were all on President Obama. And of course, even a president's comfort was woefully inadequate for these families in the face of this particularly unspeakable loss. But it became some small measure of love on a weekend when evil reigned. And the funny thing is, President Obama has never spoken about these meetings. Yes, he addressed the shooting in Newtown and gun violence in general in a subsequent speech, but he did not speak about those private gatherings. In fact, he was nearly silent on Air Force One as we rode back to Washington, and has said very little about his time with those families since. It must have been one of the defining moments of his presidency. Quiet hours in solemn classrooms, extending as much healing as was in his power to extend. But he kept it to himself never seeking to teach a lesson based on those mournful conversations or opening them up to public view. Jesus teaches us that some things, the holiest things, the most painful and important and cherished things, we are to do in secret. Not for public consumption or display, but as acts of service to each other and worship to God. For then, Scripture tells us, your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you, perhaps not now, but certainly in eternity. I learned many lessons in Newtown that day. That's one I've kept closely at heart. So that's the story of a very difficult day, but also something that I learned as well. 
So that's, I think, a little bit of what you will see in the president's devotional. I think there is inspiration that the president has mined to start his day. Um, also some stories that illuminate a different side of a, our White House in this town, Washington, that our, our national leaders live in that we often don't get to see. But to some extent, and this is specifically for the students here, I think another thing that I hope you'll get out of the book is that it's a bit of a testament to what happens when we shout down all the sort of doubts and insecurities and um, you know, hesitation that we have in our mind and step out there and do something new. You know, I was um, a kid in my mid-20s from Nashville, Tennessee, um, who had no business walking around the West Wing of the White House, but I decided to go for it. When I saw an opening, I decided to shoot an email. I wasn't qualified. I wasn't pastor of some major church, went to policy school in that seminary, you know. Um, but I think there was a plan for me, and decided to, to run towards it. And I think the exact same thing can be the case for so many of you. you know, you're gaining such tremendous skills in this school. You're going to walk out of here um, prepared to tackle uh, the world. But the one additional quality you'll need is boldness, boldness to run towards new opportunities when you see them. And I hope you'll do that, and I'm confident that you will. So thank you all. God bless you. Yeah. So I'd love to open it up to some questions, if you don't mind. If you, when you ask a question, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a process here that I'm about to violate. <laughs> hey, Mab. Hi. Hello. Um... All right. Can you hear me? There we go. Great. Hi. My name is Mab Ibrahim. Um, thank you so much for being with us. We're really glad that you're here to share um, some insight on both President Obama's faith walk um, and also your experiences uh, at the White House Office for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Um, I'm a first year student and we will start with a question from our audience. Uh, this person asks, so the president only speaks on his faith rarely to the public. What do you believe the role of a politician's faith should be in elections and in service? What do voters deserve to know about a politician's faith? Wonderful. Sorry, I'd like to be a little bit more personal. Is there, who asked that so I can just say hello? Hey there, what's your name? I'm Jake. Hey Jake, nice to meet you. Jake, you said? It's Jake. Jake, great to meet you. And the great question. Um, what should be the, um, the role of a politician's faith um, in terms of his, his or her public service? I think the most important thing is that our elected officials are authentic to who they are. You know, I think... Um, we all have a set of values and beliefs. Some of those, uh, for some of us, that's a set of religious values. Others, it may come from a different context, the way we were, we were raised, our, our sense of fairness in the, in the world. Um, and I think every elected official needs to talk about where their values are from. But not everyone um, should feel as if they have to um, communicate that in the language of religion or theology or religious doctrine. In fact, when people do that and that's not real for them, it comes off sounding so inauthentic and contrived, um, and I think is not good for them politically and not good for the country as well. That said, um, and I, I should commend to you a speech that President Obama, when he was a senator, gave on this very topic. It's a little known speech, no one's read it, but it's one of my favorite addresses that he's ever delivered. It, it was a speech he gave in 2006 called Call to Renewal. Um, he delivered it at a conference and just Google Obama Call to Renewal, and he talks about how public officials should navigate um, the, the values in the public square. Um, and the main thing is be authentic. You know, if, if, if you're a person of strong religious faith, you should not shy away from that. In fact, in the Democratic Party, I happen to be a Democrat, um, some, uh, some people feel as if they can't talk about their values and, or that they should not, and I think that's absolutely wrong. Um, at the same time, I, I think you, you should be, we should be very careful to not misuse our faith um, for explicitly political gain. And so I think you know, sometimes my friends on the other side of the aisle uh, appear to use their, their faith um, uh, in, a, in a way that seems more about politics and less about religion. And so I think um, the main thing is to be authentic, be who you are, um, and I think both voters uh, the, the voters will reward um, the folks for that, and I also think it's better for our country as well. Yes. Thank you again for. It's not. There we go. Thank you again for being here. My pleasure. Um, I'm in the corner. I just have another question from the audience, kind of following up on that last question. Um, President Obama has often invoked yeah. religious imagery in his public addresses. It's not on. Here we go. Sorry about that. It's much better. President Obama has often invoked religious imagery in his public addresses. 
Where do you think the line is between civic religion, of his civic religion of largely Christian imagery, and support for religious pluralism and tolerance in the United States? It's a great question. Who asked that so I can say hi? Sorry. Religious imagery. It's a great question. I just want to acknowledge you for it. It's okay. Remain anonymous. Um, <laughs> um, I, I w would say um, it gets back to the authentic answer um, that, you know, for the president, he happens to be a, a Christian, and I think it's okay for him to, um, to talk about his own background um, in a way that falls short of imposing that background on others or, or um, implying that anyone else's background is any less um, uh, valuable and, and worthy. I think one very clear line, and this doesn't, it's not directly related to your question, is obviously the separation of church and state, where, where the most important principle is that religious dollars, taxpayer money, can't go towards religious, explicitly religious um, um, uh, uses. And so that, that's, that's one line that's out there. I do think, and the president has been careful about this, that we have to acknowledge America's increasing and growing religious diversity. And he's talked about you know, that we're a nation of Christians and, and Muslims and Hindus and Jews and believers and non-believers alike. And I think that's very important to acknowledge. Um, the president expanded outreach to the faith community in the White House through the White House Faith-Based Office. We worked with a range of organizations through um, 13 federal agencies and lots of different programs. Um, we did events that engaged the Christian community, but we also um, held an interfaith iftar and a Passover Seder and the first ever White House event for the Sikh community and the, uh, the Hindu community as well. And so I think you know, in this um, increasingly diverse uh, society, people have to know that no matter who they are and where they come from, um, this is a government that works for them. So, so this person asks uh, how, as a politician, one might reconcile tension between their own values and beliefs and the values of the greater uh, United States. And they point out that the U.S. might have Christian values, but of course there's room for debate. And how does one keep from just advocating their own beliefs? It's a great question. I think my personal belief, and this, the president, um, as a senator, spoke to this directly in the call to renewal speech, is that we should be clear about our values in the public square. We should talk about them, if, if you know, and talk about where, um, why we're motivated to do the things that we do. But when it comes to advocating for particular policies particular pieces of legislation, um, regulatory moves, or whatever the case may be, we have to do so in a language that's accessible to all people, whether or not they share our faith. And so um, I cannot say that, um, I, I can say that my, my values uh, um, incline me to support um, immigration reform and welcoming the stranger in the, lang the language of the Bible, but I can't say that other people should support this policy because I'm a Christian or because it, it aligns with Christian values. Um, I have to explain why from a dispassionate um, policy perspective, uh, why, why others should should um, align with, with my beliefs. And so I think it's the difference between talking about who you are and where you come from and where your values are and advocating for particular policies and legislation. I think the latter has to be done in a non-sectarian manner. With much of the administration's foreign policy focusing largely on Muslim countries, how would you say this religious difference informs the president's foreign policy agenda? It's a great question. Um, hi, who asked that? I'm going to try this again. Religion and foreign policy. Don't be shy. That's OK. All right, this is the last time I'll ask. Um, so I, <laughs> um, I think. Uh, I think this president has, and through, and I'm honored to say through the faith-based office, um, has made great strides um, at the intersection of religion and foreign affairs. The reality is uh, religious leaders and actors around the globe are central players when it comes to development, when it comes to um, peace building and diplomacy. Um, yet, for far too long, uh, the United States government has had no real infrastructure to engage religious leaders and religious organizations around the globe at our various diplomatic posts, our embassies, and through our foreign service um, st um, staff. Um, we, for the first time, created something called the Interagency Working Group on Religion and Global Affairs, where we surveyed every single post around the world to figure out how they were navigating issues of religion. Um, and then we started working with the State Department to build their capacity to work with um, religion around the world. Um, I'm pleased to say that just over the last few months, the State Department has actually hired a full-time person, a guy named Sean Casey, um, to lead a new office on religious engagement at the State Department to go along with the existing office on religious and international religious freedom. Uh, that's a very big deal, and it's just it's a very practical concern. You know, if you're doing 
um, maternal and child health in, in Bangladesh. Um, there's no way to implement effective programs without the agreement of the imams there in the country. There's just, you have to work with them if you're going to be effective. If you're going to do anti-malaria work in Nigeria, you have to work with the Catholic bishops and the Muslim community there as well. And if your foreign service staff, if our, um, the people that are working on behalf of the United States government around the world don't know how to do that, if they're not trained for that and they don't have capacity, uh, then we are forsaking a significant um, set of potential partnerships. And so um, I think that's, you still, we still have to be very careful about church state issues. We still have to make sure we're aware of what we're funding and how, um, but it's absolutely essential that we build the capacity of the United States government in that space. So what role can religion play in reinventing Detroit? It's a great question. Uh, what role can religion play in Detroit? Well, I would say faith-based organizations can be a central part of turning around. Um, and uh, the, uh, Detroit, and I think some of that work is already underway. I would say, and I talked about this with your dean uh, earlier, um, it's important to layer on top of religious outreach, faith-based um, um, engagement, as well as any other social service program, rigorous program evaluation, and really making sure that whenever you're supporting an organization and you're working with um, a nonprofit or any social service entity, that the stuff they're doing is works and that it's measurable and that you can um, really quantify um, the, the, the social change. And I think um, one of the distinctions between previous iterations of the faith-based initiative and the work that we tried to do in the White House is that we were, um, we were very serious about measurement. And, um, and I have to credit my, uh, my um, econ and stats and program evaluation courses and policy school for that. So the work you're doing matters. It really, really does. Um, you will come back to that analytical framework time and time again. Um, and so I, I certainly did in my time in the White House. All right. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> this question I mean follows yeah. up a little bit on that. Yeah. Um, is the church effective at social service provision if religion must be kept separate from service delivery as dictated by charitable choice? And isn't part of the strength of faith-based organizations the actual faith part? What do you envision is the role of faith-based organizations in social service delivery to the poor? It's a great question. Um, the answer is, is going to be um, not cut and dry. There are effective faith-based organizations that do um, that, that separate their um, religious work from their non-sectarian work. That, that does exist. Lutheran services in America, Catholic charities and others, um, oftentimes they are running federally funded programs separate from their, uh, their um, more religious aspects of their work and many of those programs are effective, others are not. Um, should faith-based organizations be able to operate programs in this country motivated by their religion? Absolutely. The issue is they can't, um, if, if, if it's explicitly religious, they can't receive taxpayer dollars. And that's for very, very good reasons. Um, one is that if you're receiving taxpayer money for a religious, um, for a program that's related and um, infused with religion, then you are accountable to the government um, for your religious activity. You have to. Um, you, you have. You can. You could be audited for your worship, and your. Um, you have the government in the in the mix of your um, religiously um, related uh, programs, and that's a very scary thing. That's not anything that any of us um, wants. And I also think that while. Um, that we, we have to remember that we are a religiously diverse country. Um, there, and there are there's folks that from religious minorities that may not want their taxpayer dollars going for a particular purpose. There are folks from folks from religious majorities that may not want their taxpayer dollars going to towards a particular uh, religious organization. And we have to we have to be um, very careful about that. Last thing I would say, it's not charitable choice that brought this about. It's the First Amendment. I mean, it's just a very clear, um, uh, you know, constitutional um, concern. Um, that you know that we, we may not establish religion um, through our government, and I think it's an important one, and one that serves the church as well as it does religion. You know, the first people advocating for religious separation uh, were not um, sort of secular church state activists. It was Baptists getting happy in the fields in New England, um, not wanting the federal government to be involved in their religious activity, and um, that's very important to remember. Yeah. Yes. Question. Oh, sorry, you guys. <laughs> so often religion is cited as a source of division, but as President Obama has often alluded, his faith and the power of his faith. Hello? How 
does his faith inform his policies, and how can he use this belief, belief in faith to bring consensus among those who often oppose his actions? Sure. Um, you know, I don't want to put words in the president's mouth. I will say um, I would point folks to some speeches that he's given at the National Prayer Breakfast every year where he really explicitly talks about and has for years um, how his faith is connected to, um, to his public service. I think his faith... Um, uh, grounds him in a sense of justice, in a sense that um, of, of fairness for all people. I think his faith is closely related to his family, in, in a sense that you know we have a real responsibility to um, to our, our our families, and um, and so it's related to his life as a good husband and a good father. Um, I think that's how um, that's another way that he sees his faith manifested. Um, and um, you know, I would also say that um, the president, because of his work as an as an organizer. Um, is really grounded in the power of faith-based organizations to bring about change in neighborhoods. Um, you know, a lot of folks know that he was organizing on the south side of Chicago, but what's not as well known is that he was working explicitly with churches um, through a campaign funded by the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, uh, the Developing Communities Project. He was working with pastors to turn around neighborhoods that had been devastated by steel mill closings. Um, and uh, so he saw from a very early age that when uh, congregations get involved in community redevelopment, they can have a significant impact. And so I think that's uh, followed him over the years as well. Can you talk a little bit about any partisan issues that you have witnessed that have taken on strong religious undertones or overtones and how you reconcile your political ideology with your, your faith? Sure. Well, I definitely address the biggest one in the in the um, in the religious liberty es essay that's in the book, and so there are others in the book that you may want to um, check out as well. The um, you know, I, I would say, I mean, a contemporary one is um, the debate over SNAP, food assistance, the supplemental nutrition program, the food stamps program. Um, I think I'm I'm very um, heartened by the number of religious organizations, including conservative religious organizations, that are mobilizing to try to do something about the cuts to SNAP. It's a very mis completely misunderstood program. People think food stamps just creates dependency and that it's um, you know, being misused. Um, it has some, among the lowest fraud rates of federal programs, and around 80% of um, the, the uh, food stamp programs go towards um, households with children, senior citizens, and the disabled. Um, for those that are um, more working, uh, households, it is uh, m far more often than not a bridge towards getting back to work, um, spending less of your monthly income on food so that you can spend it on job training and improving yourself and then getting back into the workforce. It's really a ladder up um, and out of poverty rather than something else. And faith-based organizations are mobilizing on SNAP um, even now. Um, I'm hoping that they'll be able to turn it around. So that's one. Yeah. How are you able to liaison between the Pentecostal community and its varied, varied uh, racial, ethnic, and linguistic forms? And how was the president and his administration able to do this? Um, and how much of a religion 101 did you have to give to President Obama's staff? That's a great question. Uh, well, the president um, is very sort of religiously knowledgeable. Um, in, you know, he's a committed Christian himself, but has engaged diverse religious groups over the course of um, his career. Um, you know, we do religion 101 with, you know, lots of different folks, not just White House staff. You know, there's, I think they're um, in an increasingly um, secular country, there's less of a knowledge of sort of the contours of religion. Um, so we, we did that um, a, a, a fair amount. I would say, um, you know, religion reporters are also doing that every single day. I knew Raj, by the way, doing great work. <laughs> That's uh, the religion reporter from the Detroit Free Press back there. So. People should catch up with him too, um, and um, and so you know I, I think we spend a fair amount of time um, sort of uh, closing the information gap between um, you know where most people are now and you know religious groups. So we did a lot of work in that front. In terms of um, direct, and I mean we worked with Pentecostal denominations, and um, but there was no particular. Um, outreach effort there just as a part of our engagement of, of a, ra a range of organizations. How are your devotionals chosen? Random thoughts or specific topics requested? Yeah. And how do you ensure you're not promoting a political agenda? <laughs> well, you know, I, I was, I've been very careful to not try to pick devotionals that immediately reflect whatever's happening in the news cycle or political crisis. Um, they, um, uh, I, I didn't want it to feel like 
they're reading, the president was reading his news clips in the morning when he got an email from me. And so I tried to focus on more eternal principles. The president's a history buff and a music fan, a jazz fan in particular. And so I often wove together, uh, woven history um, to make a point um, with, with scripture and music as well. So there's devotionals about Nina Simone and Johnny Cash, and you heard one about from Bob Dylan, a quote from him, and, and many others too. And so lots of diverse sources. So what do you believe are the greatest accomplishments, accomplishments of the Faith-Based uh, Neighborhood Partnerships Office, and what were some of your greatest challenges? Great question. So I think our, our single biggest accomplishment was a structural one. We created a whole new set of programs where the faith-based organizations could work with the government outside of federal grants alone. Um, the previous administration largely focused on leveling the playing field so that groups could compete for federal resources, and that's important. We kept the playing field level, but I think far too many organizations out there um, saw the federal government as only an entity that they should receive funding from rather than uh, um, an institution that they could work with to solve big challenges separate from federal funding. And so we created a whole new set of programs that we called civic partnerships that were non-financial in nature. And that's a, it seems subtle, but a significant shift um, from just seeing the relationship between religion and government as one based in money, and rather than as one focused on uh, resolving real challenges in the world. Um, some of the programs that we're, I'm particularly proud of um, are the, our job clubs program. We helped uh, thousands of congregations around the country set up um, employment ministries, places where unemployed folks could come in and get resume assistance and network with local employers, but also receive sort of spiritual and emotional support um, when they're going through the tough time of unemployment. We didn't fund that. We just gave technical assistance to set these up, and we convened people together, and we started this effort that grew around the country, so we're very proud of that. Um, we also kicked off something called the President's Interfaith Campus Challenge around interfaith service. Um, and this was this was and still is, it's still ongoing, a wonderful effort to get diverse religious student groups to come together on hundreds of college campuses um, in year-long service projects. So, you know, at a given campus, Hillel, working with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and the Muslim Students um, Alliance um, and uh, the secular students group uh, on a year-long service project. We found that interfaith service, where you're actually doing things together, is oftentimes more effective in reducing tensions than interfaith dialogue, where you're talking about stuff. Um, and uh, we launched this program at college campuses around the country, and it's been an extraordinary success with, um, I think, reduced tensions, um, real programs impacting real people through service, um, and real friendships being formed across religious lines. We also kicked off the work on religion and global affairs, which I think will have ripple effects um, decades from now, and so very excited about that too. So th those are a few things. Yeah. I have a question here from Twitter. Oh, can, well. can you speak to the idea and practice of politicians tempering their faith so that it is more palatable or acceptable? Great question. You know, I'm trying to think if I know politicians that, well, you know, particularly on the, on the Democratic side, I, I um, there are some folks who feel like they are, you know, are people of strong faith but are not as comfortable in sort of talking about the, that their values in the public square. I wrote a, a cover story for Newsweek called The Secret Faith of Washington where I profiled a few of, of, of these wonderful people um, that many folks don't know that they're people of strong faith and values, but um, you know, wanted to sort of bring that out into the light. One of them was um, a senator from Minnesota, Amy Klobuchar, who is both a wonderful public official, but also is a person of very strong faith, and it's just not someone that most people would know. Um, I, so I do think we have more work to do, and again, I, um, I know this is a politically diverse um, audience. As a Democrat, I would say that we have more work to do in creating spaces for people of faith to feel comfortable about talking about their values and their beliefs um, in a way that is not you know, frowned up, uh, upon and so forth. Yeah. Um, so this member of our audience is wondering if you have any strategies for us as policymakers and future policymakers uh, on working on faith-based public policy issues. It's a great question. I would say um, the closer you can get to the ground, to the action, the better. I'm a huge fan of working at state and governments and local governments on um, nonprofit engagement and faith-based outreach and really seeing what types of programs work um, right in front of your face rather than the 30,000 foot level that we were often at in the, in, in the White House. And so to the extent that you can get that type of experience, I think it's, it's wonderful um, to, to do. Um, and, and I would also say, again, just getting back to the, you know, 
um, no matter what organization you're, wor you're working with, you know, different causes will pull at your heartstrings and just sound wonderful, but you have to make sure that you know with certainty, or as much certainty as you can, that it works, you know, that, that their programs are effective at moving the needle on issues of concern, because whether you're in a mayor's office or a governor's office or at a nonprofit or working in the White House, you're going to um, have limited resources, and they're gonna have to go one place or another, and you're gonna have to make decisions on whether, and uh, in, in, in where you make an investment you won't be able to make it in another place. And, and so you have to know with as much certainty as possible that where you're expending your resources is gonna actually have a measurable impact on people's lives. And so I think that's one important principle to think about no matter where you're working. Yeah. You've done a lot of work on issues concerning black men in America. What do you believe the administration's policy is on creating a national conversation about race? Great question. Um, yeah, so um, the context there is I ran the president's fatherhood and mentoring initiative along with my friend Michael Strutman. It's for a number of years helping to engage um, absent fathers and, and help them reconnect with their families. Also wrote a story, um, a cover story in Newsweek called The Fight for Black Men that sort of started a conversation in this space. Um, I, you know, the administration doesn't have a policy on a national conversation on race, largely because I, I, I the president, and I think others are skeptical um, about, you know, things that begin with conversation. I think, um, you know, it's, I'm not sure where one would have such a conversation and like how it would, would go down. I think it's mar much more important to actually do stuff and to practically um, create programs and opportunities um, for, um, uh, for a greater level of engagement um, with uh, communities that are falling behind um, and create practical opportunities for people to connect across these lines uh, of division. Um, so to that end, um, the president has um, kicked off a major initiative on fatherhood, as I mentioned, and supporting organizations around the country. They're helping dads reconnect um, with their families. After the Trayvon Martin verdict, the president gave, I think, a very eloquent um, uh, uh, speech, um, impromptu speech in the White House press room where he talked about the, the work that we need to do in this very space and then has followed that up with concrete action, um, working with foundations and others to support programs that bridge these racial divides. Um, and so, you know, I would say I am personally, I can't speak for the president, but I'm personally skeptical of the importance of a national conversation on race. Oftentimes the folks that come to those conversations are the ones that are already engaged, and I think it's far more important in smaller ways around the country for people to um, have a million local conversations and to support programs that actually bring people together. This asks if you can speak to the faith community's mobilization on human trafficking and your work under the Faith-Based Neighborhood Partnership Office. Did you write that, Matt? <laughs> um, Matt works on human trafficking issues and did for us in the White House. Um, I think this is a phenomenal example of interfaith cooperation and engagement on one of the most important issues I think that we're facing as a country. Um, uh, lots of groups are coming together from the folks at Passion, um, Evangelical Student Movement, um, to uh, the Islamic Society of North America, to the Jewish Council of Public Affairs, and, um, and secular or non-sectarian organizations like United Way, and are forming a coalition of faith groups and nonprofits to finally impact human trafficking. The President, President Obama um, had a faith-based advisory council that looked at this issue specifically, and my friend and colleague Mara Vanderslice put together this interfaith coalition on human trafficking that still functions to this day. So it's a very um, rich area of interfaith cooperation. Do you think your background, not as, as uh, not being a minister at a major church, um, helped your work connecting policy and faith in our religiously diverse country? Um, yeah, honestly, answer is I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, I think, um, you know, I, I certainly, um, I think I could approach a range of religious leaders with a full measure of humility, trying to learn from them rather than thinking that I knew more than them. So maybe that was helpful. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I think the honest answer is that I, I don't know if it if it if it helped or 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 hurt, but you know, worked out the way it worked out. <laughs> uh, as a nation, there are times where we can be divided. And this person asks if you could speak to any specific solutions on reconciliation and starting unity. Um, what's, it, what's the last part again? Reconciliation and what? And, and fostering unity. And fostering unity. Well, you know, I would say um, that unity is much more subversive and difficult than it sounds. We are in a culture now where it's far easier to be divisive it's, it, it, than it is to um, 
be civil and to find areas of common ground. And politicians, public officials, respond to incentives like all of us. And right now, the, the most vocal incentives are coming from the extreme ends of their base. Um, and so on the right, it is the most you know, mobilized folks in the Tea Party. On the left, it's probably the more, um, you know, the folks that are towards the fur furthest end of, of that spectrum. And because those are the ones that are speaking the loudest and raising the most money and as most active on Twitter and social networks, um, you would think that they outnumber everybody else. And they're also the ones that politicians uh, most readily respond to. The actual, the, the, the actual situation, though, is that most of America is not on those polar ends. They're actually somewhere in the middle. They want reasonable solutions. They want compromise. They want stuff to just get done. Um, but we don't hear from those folks in, in the halls of power in Washington. Um, you know, I often ask the question, and it's a question that my hand was down when someone asked me, how many people, and I'll, I'll ask today, how many people have ever visited the district office of their congressman? Just a handful, and that's fine. It's no problem. It's not like the most fun place to go, but um, <laughs> but I can guarantee you that Tea Party activists on the right and the folks that are you know to the furthest end of the left are there, and they are tweeting, and they are organizing, and they are working. They're creating a demand for um, uh, for ideological purity rather than compromise. And so, if I think if we're going to create a uh, great, greater unity, then we have to be bold enough to, um, as folks who you know, are somewhere, we may be Democrats, we may be liberal, we may be conservative, but we're not you know, on the ends of the spectrum. We have, to, we have to speak out ourselves. We have to show up at a, con at a congressional office and say, hey, I want you to end this shutdown rather than to continue it. We have to tweet our politicians when they do something that is divisive and say that um, you know, we're usually with them, but not this time. We don't like the, what they did and their tone. Uh, we have to be able to hold our own account parties accountable for those types of things. We have to create a, a demand for civility. And if, unless that happens, we're going to keep seeing this over and over again. And so I don't think it's just on Washington. I actually think it's on us as voters to, um, to speak out and to, um, to uh, you know, let our elected officials know um, that if they are reasonable, we will support them. And when they are not, we won't. Because right now, they're not hearing from us. Given increasing secularization, what do you see as the future of faith-based initiatives? I think it's, the future is strong. I, I would say, yes, I think that we are an increasingly secularized country. That said, I, I'm, I'm heartened that over the last couple of years and even over the last few months, um, there's been some, you know, some reclaiming of r true religion um, in the sense of getting back to the basics and shedding the politics and the divisiveness and really talking about what the, the core principles of our faith. And the Christian tradition, tradition which is a tradition that, that I'm in, not to speak for other people, but it's really getting back to, to Jesus and who Jesus was and what he means for this world. I'm so excited about Pope Francis. And um, I don't think that he's liberal. I don't think that he's conservative. I think he wants to get back to the basics of faith, of loving God, modeling Jesus, and serving our neighbors. And, um, and I think that... Um, that will start changing the, um, the dynamics of um, religious you know, um, affiliation in our country when people stop seeing religion as all the things that people are against and start understanding what religious people are for. So I think we've come to our last question. All right. And uh, this audience member wants to know and if- You are gonna identify yourself, this last one, okay? <laughs> 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 well, they said that they were happy to hear um, an alternative position um, on contraception than is sometimes presented um, as the administration's stance. And they said that uh, they were wondering if you could speak to the reflections of the president, um, the president's public policy relationship with the Catholic Church. Sure. You know, I, I would say that the president has a deep um, affinity for the Catholic Church um, and the historic role of the church in American life um, and, and around the globe. Um, he would often talk with me and others about um, how much he valued Car Cardinal Bernadine growing up in Chicago. Some of the young folks may not know him, but go look him up. Just a wonderful, dear soul, did tremendous work for the poor and vulnerable and you know the infrastructure of the church. Again, he, his first job was funded by CCHD, the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, um, and he uh, I think uh, 
has a, the greatest respect for organizations like Catholic Charities and Catholic Relief Services and even and the, and the good work that the Bishop's Conference is doing. I think um, you know, this has been a um, robust debate around religious liberty, um, but I think that, you know, that we're, we um, are still able and the administration was still able to maintain strong relationships with the church in other areas. Um, Catholic Relief Services is still doing tremendous work that is funded by the federal government in communities around the globe, developing uh, communities that are impoverished. Catholic um, Charities is still uh, doing phenomenal work on everything from refugee resettlement to um, anti-poverty programs um, at the same time. And so I, I think it's, you know, with big entities like the Catholic Church, um, you got to be able to manage a bunch of different relationships, relationships and dynamics and issues at the same time. Can have a, uh, I think, a challenging, um, multifaceted conversation around religious liberty on one hand, but you also have to be able to, to uh, continue the, um, the partnership with that entity on, on on other fronts. And I think that's something that the president is able to do um, without hesitation because of his deep respect for the church. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful. Yeah.